I would like to go back to the beginning of your talk and uh, talking a little bit about the modern synthesis and the necessity to extend it. Um, some years ago, I read a very interesting book which I suggest to everybody, that is the evolutionary synthesis edited by Ernest Meyer and Will Provine. And this is, as far as I know, the only uh, formal history of evolution through the uh, 20th century. Uh, I got a feeling from reading this book, and this has, in a way, changed my life. Um, the, the modern synthesis is a sort of invention. I mean, there is not a real modern synthesis. If you, just for a while, if you go through the books of the people who is supposed to have invented the modern synthesis, you see something radically different from one another. Uh, I think that a striking example is in the fact that uh, uh, when the, the large textbook uh, um, made by Dobzhansky, Ayala, Stebbins and Valentine in 1977 was published, there were two different chapters <coughs> on speciation, one by Dobzhansky and the other one by Stebbins, uh, telling very different stories. So, what I wonder is, what has uh, moved from the so-called modern synthesis <coughs> to the usual textbook or to the, the uh, fantasy of the, the layman is just a part or a subset of the modern synthesis. That was the uh, ideas put forward by, mainly by Ernst Meyer and partly by Dobzhansky. My second point is, is there really a theory of evolution? I, I know that Termoy disagrees with this, but I think that there may not be a theory evolution, of the evolution, exactly as it may not be a theory of history, I mean of, of human history. Um, you cannot uh, make a theory explaining generally what is happening in the history of humankind. And the same way, you cannot make a theory of evolution incorporating all the different uh, aspects which have to do with the, the formation of the tree of life. So, my question could be sort of provocative question. If one could have asked to, let's say, the Altenberg people, please sit down and write a textbook on evolutionary biology. What do they have written? Uh, I mean, the, the book edited by, by Pigliucci and Müller is a very interesting book, but it is not a textbook. Uh, I mean, in my uh, experience, which now lasts since 30 years of teacher of evolutionary biology, I'm really embarrassed to present to the students a model of evolution which is reasonable and uh, univoque. Um, I prefer to pass to the students different models and, and different ideas, but not as competing with one another, just, you know, parallel ideas. It may well be that part of evolution is explained through, let's say, neutral theory of evolution, and part of molecular evolution is explained through mutation and selection. Why not? So, uh, I think that uh, it may well be that the extended uh, synthesis is a sort of, of fantasy and will never be, uh, be reached. Thank you very much. I think that the uh, feeling about the synthesis is shared by many historians. I mean, there are uh, people who are looking at what happened, for example, in Britain during the formative years, let's say from the 30s until the 50s or 60s. And the story there is not the same story as that of the, what happened in America. You're looking at France, a completely different story. You're looking at Russia, a very different story. You're looking at, uh, uh, as I said, Britain, Russia, France. I don't know what happened in this country. So the story of the synthesis is certainly very different. When, but what, when we're talking about the, the modern synthesis, we're talking about a kind of hegemonic view that began to appear in textbooks and that was uh, sort of transmitted to students from one, genera one generation of students to the next. I mean, Futurima, for example, okay, uh, or other people, uh, Ridley book. 
where you have a theory of evolution, there is, yes, there is neutral stuff, there is migration, there is some kind of a little bit of mutation pressure here and there. Most of the time we have natural selection shaping this variation. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, uh, natural selection, as I said, I believe it's very important. So I think that uh, this is the hegemonic view. And uh, the, what is interesting about the hegemonic of course, when you are looking at the details of the history, of uh, what happened in different places and by different people, you see a very, very different uh, picture. As I said, for example, uh, Waddington wrote a series of three books, very important books, about uh, where he integrated the then existing knowledge. There was not much knowledge on epigenetics in the modern sense. But he had integrated very, very intelligently uh, developmental biology and uh, uh, genetics in the world. Incredible. So it didn't have much effect. So we're talking when we're talking about modern synthesis, we're talking about something that not, appeared not only uh, among in, in the popular view, but, the, but which became a kind of socializing theory for evolutionary biologists since the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And it's beginning to change. So this is what I mean by the modern synthesis. I agree with you that when you look at the details, and the Provine book is very, very informative. I talked with uh, Will Provine about this book, and uh, <laughs> he is very, very critical of what was going on, extremely critical. Also about his own writings about Sewell Grant. Yeah. So anyway, but uh, this is. But, but you are right about this. This, it was, uh, if you are looking at the history, the history tells you that the picture was much more complicated, much more variable, and much more interesting than some of the thing that came to dominate the textbooks in the end. But the thing that came to dominate the textbook in the end is what is then, uh, you know, here again and again. So that's uh, another thing. Is there a theory of evolution? And what would one do if one wrote a theory, uh, a textbook? Well, I think if you are looking, look, if you are looking at a particular uh, evolutionary question, how did species X evolve, or how did this lineage evolve, and you want to give a good answer, your answer will be based on a lot of data and a lot of contingencies. This was more important than this, and this ecological condition, that ecological condition, there was a lot of drift here, and there was some migration there, and there was mutation pressure there, and there was a lot of epigenetics here, and there was a lot of selection on this gene, and the other gene was not selected, and so on and so forth. So you will have a very, very special kind of uh, answer, and you cannot generalize in the same way that you cannot generalize about a particular historical event. But I think that what we're trying to do is, when we're thinking about evolutionary biology as a theory, is to have a certain set of uh, conceptual tools that are, it's not a theory in the same uh, sense, because it's a historical theory, it's not a theory in the same, exactly in the same sense as a theory, uh, the kind of theory in classical physics. But it is a theory in the sense that we do have a conceptual toolbox, which is very important. And one of the things that has been dominating this toolbox has, has, was the idea that uh, the thing that we have to concentrate on is selection, natural selection. Variation is given for, to us for free, so to speak. We don't have to, uh, we have, don't have to say anything about it. There's just a lot of it there. There are lots of random mutations, a lot of recombination happening, and we just have a lot of it, and that's it. And we select. So we don't have to say anything. If this is how we think about variation, well, what can we say about it? Nothing. It's there. And you select it. That's it.